morning, everybody. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. In the summer of 2009, Terry Herbert was out of work. And as a lot of people do, I was talking to somebody right before service who, right after he retired, bought one of these. Everybody know what one of these is? Metal detector. Two best days in a metal detector's life usually is the day you buy it and the day you sell it. <laughs> I like boats. Um, it's a hobby. You know, I, if, you're, if this is your get-rich-quick scheme, you might want to choose a different tactic. But, but he, you know, he had some time on his hands. He, there wasn't really any prospect out there. And so he, he got himself one of these and um, uh, stayed close to home. He, was, uh, he lived in the middle part of England, the Midlands. And right off of A5, which is one of the main highways there, which is where he lived close to, it was a farmer's field, Fred Johnson. He didn't know Fred. But uh, he, he took interest in this field for whatever reason. It had recently been cut down, and he thought, oh, okay, well, it might be easier. Maybe Fred would let me kind of get out in there. Uh, Fred didn't initially like Terry. <laughs> you know, who's this guy showing up with a metal detector? What's he think he's going to find? He relented, and he's like, okay, well, sure, whatever. So Terry goes out with his metal detector, and at first is just finding what you would expect to find, little bits of kind of garbage, really, you know, metal machinery, all this stuff until he stumbled across something that was actually very shallow in the earth, and as he dug, it was gold. Uh, and he scoured a little more, and just in a very short area, discovered not just gold, but very old gold. Anglo-Saxon gold, dating back to the 7th century A.D., 1,500 years old. He went back to Fred and he said, Fred, sit down. <laughs> We've stumbled across something here. And as the team was brought in, the way the UK works, you know, it can go to a museum or whatever, but they had to call in some folks to really get after this. They found 3,500 pieces of this ancient Anglo-Saxon gold and silver, about 11 pounds worth of the gold, and I forget how much of the silver, 3,500 pieces Valued at around $5 million. Uh, Fred and Terry were okay after that. <laughs> <laughs> but they had no idea what they were. Uh, Fred had no idea that treasure was in his field. Terry certainly didn't know as he was just kind of going out with some curiosity and a little, you know, magnetic stick to find something of value. He found something that was... Not only, a na not only monetary value, but a national treasure because it opened up for historians who had been sort of guessing at what life in the Dark Ages was like. It transformed their thinking about what those people had and didn't have. They were, turns out they were very wealthy people who had incredible skill and craftsmanship. Some of the, look at this stuff up on YouTube or, or uh, Google. The craftsmanship that went into these gold pieces, even just the fragments of it, and now it's on display and millions of people have been able to view this treasure because of one man's discovery on a day in July, back in 2009. Here's the curiosity that I have, because even the smartest people on the case, historians, ar uh, archaeologists, all this stuff, can't answer a simple question. Why in the world was this treasure buried in a field? Nobody's been able to, they make some pretty good guesses. Well, there might have been a war, or maybe somebody had stolen it and absconded with it, and they didn't want to get caught, so they dumped it in this field, and then they thought they were going to come back and never did. Or whatever. Nobody can answer that. And, and when we think about the life of faith, I think there's some amazing parallels to that, because one of the things that we hear in public, you, you absolutely probably have heard this from somebody, or maybe you believe this yourself. We talk about my butt is in the way, you say, well, I believe in God, but it's private. You ever heard anybody say that? I believe in God, but, but it's, it's private. And there's some, maybe some good reasons for that, at least in people's minds, why they would say that. When we think about faith, faith is kind of one of those deep conviction level type things that, that maybe not be an icebreaker conversation with a lot of people. Hey, my name's Joe. How's your faith? You know, um, for some people, that's very natural. But for most people, there's sort of this, whoa, wait a minute, we don't know each other yet. Um, we're not going to go there. And so a lot of people, and again, maybe you're one of these people who would say, you know, honestly, at the end of the day, it's kind of none of your business. 
I, I'm going to keep this to myself, keep it between me and God, and you just stay out of my stuff. Uh, never mind the fact that we'll talk loudly and long about any other topic on planet Earth, post it on social media, all these kinds of things. But when it comes to faith, it's like, hey, buddy, okay, back off. There's another, um, there's another reason that people might keep that to themselves. And again, maybe you're one. There, there's, I don't know if embarrassment is the right word, but there's definitely kind of a tentative nature because we feel like sometimes when we look at this, what we think are the religious super elites, the Mother Teresas, the, you know, the, the high-profile figures who seem to be able to say the right things and they just do these amazing things. I could never do that. We put people up on a pedestal and then we think that's what everybody should be like and we're not even close. We don't know enough. We haven't read enough. We don't have all the Bible verses memorized. We don't know all this stuff. We, and so we sell ourselves short. Well, that really taps into two things that are common in the human experience. One is pride. Pride in thinking too much of ourselves like faith is something that we have a right to keep to ourselves. And the other is fear. That uncertainty that says, oh, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how this would go if I put myself out there, how people would receive that. Would they think less of me? Would they reject me? And those are common things. They're very big reasons why people might choose to keep their faith to themselves. Now, here's the deal. We all have secrets. We all have things we don't want to just blab to the world. Maybe it's the worst thing you've ever done that can immediately come to mind as soon as I say that. Well, you're not going to just get that out. Your health information is private. There are other things in your life that definitely are not everybody's business. I'm here to ask you, is your faith one of those? Is your faith one of those? Because as we're going to see in Scripture today, Jesus said emphatic no. That your faith precisely is not private. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to turn on the metal detector. We're going to do a little digging ourselves. And very quickly in the Scripture is going to unearth some treasure that I want you to to begin to look at, to examine, and to see the value of what Jesus had to say, not just to people thousands of years ago that he was talking to, but to you and I today about the idea of my faith being private, that I can believe in God, but keep it to myself. So that's what we want to look at today, okay? God's big idea, if we were going to sum it up, slap it on a bumper sticker, is this. There's no, good, uh, there's no need to hide a good thing. This, this is Jesus right almost out of the gate in his earthly ministry saying this very thing. There's no need to hide a good thing. Well, where do we find that? Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, first book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Sounds like the Beatles, yeah? <laughs> Matthew. Jesus, very early in his ministry, gets up and preaches, if you read it beginning to end, a 20-minute sermon. Talk about setting the bar high. I never get there. 20-minute sermon, he begins with what is known as the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There's the kingdom, you know, all these, all these nice things. And then he launches into some of the greatest wisdom that humanity has ever come across. Right out of the mouth of this 30-year-old carpenter. And the crowds had gathered to hear him. But here's the thing I want to look at. When we think about people who say, and maybe you're one of them, like I, th like I say, who say, I believe in God, but it's private where Jesus pushes back on that to the crowds that he spoke to and across history to you and I today. Here's the three things that he tried to say that faith was instead of being private. The first thing was that it's practical. Faith is practical. Matthew 13. Let's just jump right. There's a couple verses today. Matthew chapter 13. Here's what Jesus says. You are the salt of the earth. Well, that doesn't really sound like a compliment today, but we'll get there. What if the salt loses its saltiness? How can it be made salty again? Good question. It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, let's rewind the tape a little bit. Salt of the earth. That's a common expression even today. It usually describes somebody of impeccable character, who is, you know, give you the shirt off of their back, would do anything for you. They, they're noble, they're honest, they're people of integrity, all this stuff. Jesus comes right out of the gate to his crowd and says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, again, the divide of history, we, we got to back it up a little bit and think about the significance of salt 
in first century Middle East. How many of you have a refrigerator? Okay. In first century, in the Middle East, you would not have had a refrigerator. Or Starbucks. And some of you go, ah, how could we live? But in order to preserve things that you wanted to keep around, to keep them from spoiling, you did what? You used salt as a preservative. It was there. And that's where its value came from. It wasn't just that you had it. Yes, it was a commodity and it had value because it was so useful. But that's the thing. The value came from it being used. Jesus says, look, if salt loses its saltiness, basically if it's sitting on the shelf and it just goes bad, well, you're sitting on nothing. It's worthless. You just throw it into the fire to, to stoke the fire at that point. It's lost something because the value is assigned to its usefulness. It's most valuable when it's put to good use. We're on vacation last week in Southern California and went to a car museum. This car museum exceeded my expectations because I had seen some of the pictures and then we went and it was like, I just never been around that. Some of you have nice cars, but this was a room full of some of the most beautiful automobiles I have ever seen. There was an entire row of Ferraris. An entire, you could have thrown a blanket over about $2 million worth of automobiles just in like the span of 20 or 30 feet. They had Mario Andretti's old Indy car. They had Kit <laughs> from Knight Rider. I was like, oh, you know, a signed replica of the General Lee from all the cast of the Dukes of Hazard, and uh, all these amazing cars, Lamborghinis, and just this, I was like, you know, my kids are like, Dad, please, drool is not a cool look for you. <laughs> and I loved it. We spent way too much time. I'm taking videos like a kid at Christmas and all this stuff, but I came back from that, and I thought, wait a minute. Something's not right here. What? Why did I love this, but then there's something missing? Uh, Enzo Ferrari put a lot of his heart and soul and passion into making a Ferrari. It's a beautiful thing to see. Do not get me wrong. I mean, it just looks fast just sitting. But that's not what he built those cars to do. He built them to go and to go fast. They're most useful when they're driven, not when they're being looked at. Yes, they have value because they're old and they're not making some of those anymore, but their greatest use is when somebody gets in the driver's seat and goes somewhere. That's when a Ferrari is a Ferrari. And when you hear it, you go, ah, that was the missing piece. Friends, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. What in the world are you good for? What are you good for? We live a lot of our lives picturing faith and belief as this thing that we sort of tidy up and we get rid of all the bad stuff and we just focus on the good stuff. And basically what we're doing is turning ourselves into museum piece that sits on a shelf for people to maybe look at if they're walking by. Maybe if they're curious, they'll come look. Instead of getting in the driver's seat and going for a drive, putting ourselves out there and really experiencing the fullness of what it means to be in relationship with God. That is not a private activity. It's very practical because you see, it's not, it's not compartmentalized at that point. We're not saying, okay, well, God, you get this part of me over here. Maybe when I'm by myself or maybe when I'm out in nature, just me and you and all that. That's fine. But there's this whole other aspect of living the Christian life that is supposed to be integrated. Your faith is supposed to be integrated into your life, into your work, into your relationships, into your everyday experiences behind the wheel. Someplace that's the greatest <laughs> uh, point of friction right there, isn't it? How can I love Jesus and get from here to, you know, North Richland? I don't know how to do that. Um, it's supposed to be integrated into our experience. It's not a private act. It's very practical. And at some point, it's going to spill out into our relationships with other people. They're going to notice it when it becomes something more than just you know, not saying the wrong words or not doing the wrong things, right? It becomes a part of your life. Is it perfect? No. No, faith is a work in progress. Work out your faith. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It takes practice. That's why it's called practical because it involves some repetition. It involves making some mistakes. It involves getting in there and being salt. 
being a difference maker in the lives of other people, not just sitting on a shelf, waiting and waiting and waiting. Some of you are waiting for the perfect set of circumstances for God to use you. And I'm, friend, <laughs> the wait is over. Okay? Now, here's another thing I was considering on those. In the meantime, some of you are in a waiting time right now, just, just in life. Your health has got you in a waiting period. Your finances have you in a waiting period. Your relationships have you in a waiting period. My question is twofold. What are you ready for? Are you getting yourself ready for something? See, that's where practice is. NFL preseason just started. You know what those players have been doing the last six months or so in between Super Bowl and They've been training. They don't show up to practice the first day going, oh, man, I shouldn't have eaten all those tacos the last six months. No, they've been getting after it. They've been in the weight room. They've been doing it so that they're ready. Are you ready? Have you been parking it on your sofa the last two years? I'm just asking, right? My clothes all shrunk the last two years too, but I, spiritually speaking, <laughs> are you waiting for something? Because I tell you what, life has absolutely moved on in these last two years. Are you ready? And you say, well, Jace, I, I, don't, I don't really know. I don't feel very spiritually accomplished, religiously proficient, all this stuff. Let me ask you this. What are you good at? What are you good at? What are you naturally inclined to? Can you move toward that thing? Because guess what? If you can move towards it, I bet somebody else is too. Who, who could use a friend? Who, who maybe needs Jesus? Who maybe is hurting or struggling? Those are things that you can begin to think about instead of just keeping God safe to yourself. You don't have to protect God. <laughs> He's pretty good on his own. You can begin to incorporate it into your life. This is what Jesus is trying to teach us. Second thing I, want, I think he wants to teach us is that your faith isn't private, it's public. It's public. What does he say in the next part in, in uh, Matthew 5? You, now again, English betrays us here. We use you for singular and you for plural, a group of people. Jesus is using the plural. He's talking to a group of people, not just individuals. He says, you all are the light of the world. Now, that's very curious to me because he also called himself the light of the world. He's inviting us to associate with who he is and his mission. Faith isn't private. It's, it's connected. It's identified with Jesus Christ. You all are the light of the world. These are people who lived a peasant existence under Roman oppression. And Rome didn't think very highly of them. And Jesus immediately elevates their status and says, Look, I don't care what the world's been telling you. You all are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Duh. It's obvious. It's up. It, you know, it's hard to miss. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. That makes no sense. Why in the world would you put a city on a hill if you wanted it to be hidden? Why would you light a lamp and put a lid on it? You don't do that. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. That is not a private activity. You can believe in God all you want and nurture inner faith, but at some point, that light's got to get out. It's got to get out. Our act of getting together for worship, whether you're joining us online, whether you're here in person, the night of worship we just did, baptism we're going to do next week, we don't, we don't hold these things in a vacuum. We open ourselves up. Sunday morning is a... Anybody from this town can walk through our doors. We take a risk doing that, by the way. When we do baptisms at the river... We, we don't put up, you know, uh, do not cross signs. We, we do it in front of everybody. When we do baptisms here, we tried doing baptisms at the river in February one time. It did not go well. So <laughs> forgive us that we do it here a couple times a year or two. But regularly, we are in the practice of parading people in front of a group of strangers to give them a chance to make an outward expression of an inward decision. That is a very scary thing. Do you remember, those of you who have been baptized, do you remember that? I was 10 years old. I was shaking in my boots because there was all these people. And Pastor John T. Van, who was like six foot nine at the time, it seemed like to me. And, I, you know, we'd never had conversation before. And here we're, he's asking me if I profess my faith. And 
I remember that. Day. I'll remember it my whole life, I think. Very nerve-wracking, but I didn't let the public nature of it keep me from doing something that I really believed in my heart. We're going to ask you to do some public things around here. We ask you to raise your hand sometimes if God's working in your life. We're going to ask you to lead small groups because we believe in the power of togetherness. There's a theology at work there where we, as Adam said earlier, God is at work in specific ways when we do things together. And you won't know that if you don't put your faith to work and try. But there is a risk. I know that. I know that. Private devotion only goes so far. I was thinking about this, and I don't know if somebody else said this, or I guess I can trademark it if this is an original quote. I I was thinking, what you do in private builds character. You know, folks who come out in their, you know, summer tank tops, and they're all swole, and, you know, they've been doing their work and all that stuff, they've spent their time in the gym. It's obvious. But what we do in public builds community. Think about that. When we, what we do in private builds character. Yes, there has to be some diligence behind the scenes, doing the unseen things. Jesus talked about as much. A lot of what we're supposed to do is supposed to be low on the radar, off the radar, so that only God sees. But the understanding still was that you're doing things for the benefit of others, not just to build your own private piety, that you're benefiting others, that you are building community. Because when God's people get to work, even in small ways, Good things happen when we get together and do these things. It doesn't have to be massive crowds all the time, but there definitely is a sense in which we do things together to build community. But here's the question. Here's the question, because this is where it presses in for so many people who don't want to be identified with a group of people because I'm a party of one, I'm self-sufficient, and that's really prevalent out here in the Pacific Northwest, I have found. Here's the question you got to ask. What's the worst thing that could happen if others knew? What is the worst thing that could happen if others knew where you stood with the Lord? Even if you're like, I still got questions, I still got... Okay, but to even go there, to even talk about it, to invite a conversation or to... For somebody to know that you come here or that you've read the Bible, that you pray, that you have some sort of signs of spiritual life. What's the worst thing that could happen? As I wrestled with this question, I came down to one simple answer. And it's not an easy one. The worst thing that could happen if others knew is that you could die. That's the worst thing that could happen. You could die. And maybe your family could die. We call those people martyrs. Not martyr like a drama, victim, whatever. Actual martyrs. People have been dying for their faith for millennia. And you might be one of them. I'm not going to candy coat that at all because God does not ask us to do easy things all the time. He asks us to do important things. And the risk that we take of going public with our faith, the worst thing that could happen to us is that we would die. And Paul had laser focus on this when he wrote, and he said, to live is Christ, to die is what? gain. You only have heaven to look forward to. But we hang on so tightly. And Jesus in another, <laughs> expre- uh, another quote of his says, look, if you're hanging on so tightly to that kind of existence, you're going to lose your life. You're going to miss out. But if you lose your life, if you get rid of all that protection, preservation mentality, and you invest your life for the sake of others who may hate you, who may torture and kill you, who may marginalize you, who may unfriend you, whatever, and you embrace life that is life, you will find it. I am so afraid in our modern culture we have made a terrible exchange and invested our life, even our faith, in only what we can see and touch and pull out of the bank or drive out of the driveway. That's a horrible trade. Jesus says, no, at some point, this is going to cost you. Got awful quiet. Because some of you are doing the math right now and figuring out that that's where you're at. I have to ask that question regularly. It doesn't matter. I'm not saying work to earn your salvation. I'm saying, is it worth the risk to gain the kind of reward that Christ is inviting us to. 
And, and here's the other piece too. I'm in the business these days of trying to save people from a ton of regret. I do not want you to get to the end of your life and wish you would have. That would be an awful thing to have to take with you to the grave. I want to save you from that and assure you that whatever risk you take in going public is worth the cost. God has promised his living spirit with us to give us courage to do the hard things, to have the difficult conversations, to go into dark places so that we don't have to keep our light under a bowl like this and wonder, 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 wonder. At some point, God says, look, you shine your light and let me take care of the rest. I will take care of you in this life and beyond. Where you at? Final thing I think Jesus wants to teach us Instead of saying, oh, I believe in God, but my faith is private, is no, it's not private, it's personal. It's personal. Listen to what he, how he finishes out this little uh, bit of his, his uh, sermon, Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Okay? Yes, we don't do it for public show, just say, hey, look at me, hey, look at me, hey, look at me. Jesus says, no, let your light shine so that they may see your good deeds and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. We, we're here to make God famous, not to get more likes and subscriptions, <laughs> not to have more followers. We're here to shine a light on what God is doing, to make God famous. We are his publicity campaign. You can't do that under lock and key where everything's classified and confidential. Oh, can't let anybody else know. Ah, uh-uh, that's not why you're here. So it has to be personal. And, and I'm sorry to say you can't ride on the coattails of others. Well, my parents were this, so therefore I, no, uh-uh. no, nope, no, nope. we don't phone this stuff in. This has to be something that you own. The good part is, is when you experience for yourself the grace of God, it begins to do a work in your life. It's very hard to explain, but it begins to transform you from the inside out so that you begin to soften a hard heart, less judgmental, more compassionate. You begin to have the wherewithal through God's Holy Spirit to extend kindness to those who do not deserve it, grace and compassion to those who need it most, and to venture into the darkest places on earth with light. We um, went to Knott's Berry Farm while we were down in California, and um, I used to eat roller coasters for breakfast, and I cannot do that anymore. <laughs> um, my kids, however, well, oh, and not so much. Maya, definitely. She's like, more, more. So we get there right the first thing, and she sees the tallest thing there. It's the, I forget what it's called, something scream, which should have told me enough. <laughs> they basically hoist you up and then just go, whoop and drop you to the, you know, and then there's a suspension thing and it bounces you back up a little bit. I'm thinking, okay, what did I have for breakfast? Because I'm immediately regretting that. I shouldn't have been eating the last three days. And of course, they want dad to come because it isn't so much fun to do things as a family. I'm like, oh, now you want to do together things. (laughs) So we get in line and uh, California was a little cooler than it was here last week, but not totally cool. And if you know lines in amusement parks, they tend to wind. And I'm not a patient person anyways. I don't know how in the world I ever waited hours for some of these rides. I couldn't wait 10 minutes now. But we're out in this section that was not shaded. And the wind shut off. And it started getting hot. And my face, which was sunburned up until then, started to get a little pale. And I made the mistake of looking up and watching it drop. And looking up. Watching it drop. It's kind of like sitting watching the the wash (laughs) at a laundromat. You know, you just don't want to do that very long. And all of a sudden, I'm feeling a little woozy. I couldn't breathe. And I'm looking for the exits. And I couldn't. I was stuck. But we were right next to a fence. And let's just say what happened next was better that it happened on the ground than it happened at 200 feet. (laughs) But it happened. And it's... I was just like, oh, no. And we all had to leave. You know, my kids couldn't ride the ride. I, we got to leave. And I just look ashen, right? And we go and sit down. And I'm just feeling the worst, right? This is humiliating. And out of nowhere, I 
I knew I was going to do that when I told this. It seems so simple, though, and I, I, I want to get around to it. Out of nowhere, this voice says, you need some water. Now, have you been to an amusement park recently? They're not giving water away. <laughs> it's like five, six bucks for a little, you know. She's, do you need some water? Well, she didn't just have water. She had the one that she had put in the freezer before, the night before. It was frozen. It was, oh, I was like, thank you, you know, so much. And uh, took the water and was going to, you know, once I could stand up again, was going to go get some water to repay her for her kindness. And she was gone before I could. I brought the waters back and she was already gone. I, you know, and did the job, felt better, could make it through the rest of the night. Gets dark. This, uh, we're walking around a different part of the park, and out of nowhere again, I hear the same woman say, how you doing? I said, oh, much better. Thank you so much. I said, I, I did get some water. Do you want me to? She goes, no, it's fine. She says, she says, I'm a nurse. <laughs> of course she was. She says, I knew the moment I saw you what was going on and what you needed. Now, that's all well and good. And God bless her. She didn't say any more. She didn't throw me the four spiritual laws, ask me if I, you know, was going to die tonight, would I go to heaven? That would have been a good time, though, because I did think I was going <clears> to. <throat> she gave me a bottle of water. In my life, I probably will never forget that because at that point, I needed something that she had. And she recognized it and she knew exactly what to do. And she didn't just know what to do. She didn't just come right out and start explaining her pedigree and all this stuff. She just gave me the water. She was equipped but she wasn't just resting on her laurels. She, at some point, when she made a commitment to be a nurse, said, I'm going to be a nurse because I want to help people who need it. I'm not going to keep that skill to myself. I'm not going to keep that knowledge to myself. I'm not just going to do this so people go, oh, you're a nurse, that's so great. I'm going to help people that need it. Folks, do you have what other people need? Who needs what you have? Do you know them? I guarantee somebody needs what you have. And if you don't know them, let me encourage you to do what Jesus did. Start taking your light into some dark places. Well, Jason, my light's not very bright. I, you know, I still have this hang up. I still have this whatever. The darker the night, the brighter the light. You don't have to be the world's greatest, but you do have to shine. And you got to make it personal. You got to do that work yourself. You got to say, Jesus, I, whatever my hang ups and misgivings are, I'm going to hand that over to you and I want you to be in charge. There's no need to hide a good thing. You know why? Because you are the treasure. You are the treasure that God has sought. And that he came for and that he sacrificed his one and only son to die for, to pay the price for whatever you think can't go public. To erase the guilt and the shame of all that. If you are here in this place today and that is your hang up, I have great news for you. There is freedom from that so that you can get on with the business at hand, which is taking something that is classified and declassifying it and sharing it and sharing it, and sharing it, and giving your life to the only thing that matters, which is the cause of Christ. I'm going to pray to that end right now as we wrap up. Lord Jesus, thank you for doing for us what we could not have done for ourselves, for stepping out of heaven and walking into the field of earth and running your magnet through the sand and finding us. We may feel broken and bent, buried beneath whatever weight. But God, when you raise us up and clean us up, you want us to be put on display so that the world can see and change the way they think about you. We are your representatives. We are your ambassadors. Help us to do that, God. And if there's somebody here today who has never experienced your grace, that they would at least, that they would at the very least let down the guards of their heart for a moment to let you in fully to do what it is you want to do, to clean us up from the inside out, to make us not a museum piece, 
but something drivable and beautiful and useful for you. We ask for nothing less. I'm going to ask you, if you've made that prayer this morning and repented, I'm going to ask you to do something brave. At home, East Venue, West Venue, would you just raise up your hand? Would you say, I prayed that prayer today. Thank you so much. Thank you for being bold. See, that's the first step. We tell ourselves we can't, and then we're asked to do it, and we do it, and we find out we can. God is a God of can. You can do these things. He wants you to do these things. He's good. He loves you. He cares about you. You can do these things so that the world may know. God, thank you for your goodness. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.